Hi everybody, it is Monday the 27th and I'd like to just remind you that there is an email that goes out to your parents every Monday from me um, <clears throat> reminding you of stuff you probably already know. But the big news is that this Wednesday we are going to have a Zoom meeting at 1 p.m. Central Time. And um, instead of a daily video, we're going to have a Zoom meeting. Let's see how that works. So uh, the link came to you in the email that went to your parents. If for some reason you are, I don't know, parentless, if you don't have access, if your parents don't have access to the email anymore, I don't know, werewolves have trapped you away from the internet, I don't know how you're watching this, whatever is going on, uh, you should email me at kbaker at ecusd7.org uh, and I'll send you the link. So uh, no visitors please. Nobody from outside the classroom is permitted um, on the call. There's just a limit on the number of people we can have and I don't need other... I mean if you ha want to get 12 people together and have a party with one login, hey whatever, that's great. When we do this, um, you will enter muted, and um, it may take a while for everybody to show up. Uh, there's potentially 120 people, which means you're not all going to get a chance to speak. Um, maybe you can, but if you want to say hi to someone, you can do so in the chat feature. Hopefully you know how to use Zoom at this point. If not, why don't you look up a tutorial and... Um, I hope to see you on Wednesday. So if you want to have a question for me during the lesson on Wednesday, then go ahead and um, send it in, a, in the chat feature. Uh, you can do so publicly to the whole group. And we can all see what question you're asking. It'll save a little bit of time. All right, on to today's lesson. Let's try to finish the Vietnam War. Uh, one of the things that caused the countercultural revolution to grow in the 1960s was the draft. Uh, the concept of the draft, of course, has been with us since the beginning of our nation. But men ages 18 to 26 were eligible for the draft during the Vietnam War. And that's a little bit of a problem because no one could vote unless they were 21 years old. So from 18 to 20, um, men were being drafted. They couldn't drink alcohol. They couldn't um, uh, vote. And yet they were given a gun, sent to a foreign land, and died for their country. That doesn't seem equitable, uh, and it led, of course, to an amendment to change that. But if you were in college, you got a deferment. You had a 97% chance of avoiding the draft. It wasn't a guarantee. One of my favorite authors was drafted while in college, and um, he, he wrote a lot about it afterwards, which is why I know. But... Um, the draft itself had a tendency to target the um, non-white and the lower socioeconomic classes in a manner disproportionately. Because if you could afford college, you probably didn't have to go to war. If you could not afford college, you may have had to go to war, and the government would force you to do so. So it tended to be the poor, it tended to be African Americans um, who went and fought. So it was a skewed demographic, and it was very much, literally, a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. Uh, so we started on slide 31. Let's move on to slide 32. And there were some, if you saw the video last week on Thursday, you know that innocent people died. I'm not suggesting that they were targeted, but there were a lot of mechanisms that killed indiscriminately, uh, and which led to the death of civilians in the Vietnam War. So that, number one, led a lot of people to protest the war. Uh, number two, the Vietnamese weren't really communists at heart. Of course their government changed to be communist, but they were nationalists. They rejected Western mercantilism. That's what they were really fighting against. And we simply replaced the French in that role. So the government had lied to the American people repeatedly uh, over decades. In fact, uh, the Pentagon Papers were um, discovered by some good 
investigative journalism, and they detailed many of the dirty secrets that our government was keeping from the American people, that we had used money secretly, we had engaged in a lot of wartime activities secretly in a way that were not um, a legal nor constitutional, that we had given aid to France without congressional approval during their time as a Western mercantilist in Vietnam. We had policies that were not made public uh, that actually had led to the death of both soldiers and civilians. So um, America started to distrust government. Um, student protests began to spread across the nation. One of the first hotbeds of protest was at UC Berkeley. If you've not been to Berkeley, it has a history of protests. Um, and some men became conscientious objectors. They opposed the war on either religious or moral grounds and fled to foreign nations. In fact, 100,000 American men became draft dodgers and fled to Canada during the war. Some of the protests turned violent. The SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, um, and their splinter group, the Weathermen, decided to um, participate in protests in a way that led to the death of some Americans. Um, we also see that the tensions across the countercultural revolution in America um, were visible at the Kent State University shooting in 1970. The governor of Ohio sent troops to Kent State to stop rioting. I'm amused by the use of the word rioting. There were protests on campus. I don't think I would call it rioting. Um, that word is designed to create a, a pejorative sentiment um, in the reader. But uh, during the confrontation, guns were fired, although the protesters certainly didn't have guns and they weren't threatening the troops. Um, but four students were killed. Uh, normally, I would not show a dead body. I have a policy of not showing dead bodies, but the Vietnam War, as you know from last week, um, saw the rules go out the window. Uh, one of the challenges we have in the Vietnam War era is that it was characterized by people who died who didn't need to die. Uh, that describes the Vietnam War pretty well, and this image from Kent State University uh, has describes the same thing. So. In Vietnam, the government of the United States had said that we were winning. In fact, the U.S. military said that we were winning, the U.S. government said we were winning, and on January 30th, 1968, the Vietnamese conducted, the North Vietnamese conducted the Tet Offensive during the Vietnamese New Year. It was a simultaneous attack on all U.S. installations around South Vietnam. And this was really the last straw um, for the American people. Um, You'll, if you go ahead two slides to slide 38, you'll see some red dots on the South Vietnam map indicating where they took place. But this was really the final straw for the U.S. public. The government said that the North Vietnamese Army had been finished. If that's true, how could they stage a simultaneous attack on all U.S. installations around Vietnam at the same time? Someone must be lying. And so it is time for the U.S. troops to come home, according to the American people. And um, even Saigon uh, and the U.S. Embassy in Saigon had been attacked. In fact, uh, the, Viet, the Viet Cong had actually captured this, the embassy in Saigon for a couple hours. Who, and America asked this question. Who do we blame for the Vietnam War? Do we blame Eisenhower, who first sent advisors? Uh, do we blame Kennedy, who sent more advisors, and like over 10,000, up to 16,000 advisors? Do we send Johnson, who turned it into a full-fledged war and distracted him from his great society? Do we blame Nixon, who conducted the largest bombing campaign in human history, uh, ultimately dropping more bombs than all sides in World War II dropped anywhere during all of World War II? That's a lot of bombs just for Vietnam. Uh, do we blame William Westmoreland, who didn't understand the war and simply conducted uh, search and destroy missions to try to achieve a body count, which in no way creates an exit strategy or a solution? I mean, no one really understood Vietnam while we were in Vietnam. So don't assume that your government understands the war that they're fighting while they're fighting it. That has not always been true. Um, okay, on slide 41, we are going to start the countercultural revolution. We've talked a little bit about this before, uh, and tomorrow we're going to talk more about these other elements. We've already talked about Vietnam, the civil rights movement. Uh, tomorrow, 
um, we may talk about the women's movement, Latino movement, and the environmental movement. A lot of changes happened in the 70s. But the counterculture revolution itself uh, tried to address a lot that was wrong with the U.S. culture. And they rejected formality, adopting new simple forms of dress. They rejected, I mean, the Kinsey Report helped, you can Google that if you'd like. I'm not, I'm not allowed to actually read that to you um, in the curriculum, but I read it when I was in high school, and I, I learned a lot. Um, new, there's a show also, and the show is terrible. It's not terribly aligned with the actual science of it, but uh, there are new different sexual attitudes that come to characterize the countercultural revolution. There's less um, obedience to religious morality in terms of sexual attitudes. Um, I think one of the questions that, well, I'm, I'm sure one of the questions that showed up during the countercultural rev revolution is why does, why does someone else's religion get to di dictate how my sexual behavior um, is conducted? Uh, number three, there's a new mistrust of government. Uh, basically, that era of young people said, don't trust anyone over 30. That was one of the slogans of the countercultural revolution. Uh, I'll echo that. You probably should ask more questions of authority figures. Uh, number four, there was a recreational use of drugs. One of the challenges we saw in the 1970s is that there weren't that many drug laws I know that in your world today, um, the drugs, all the drugs are bad and illegal drugs, of course, are illegal. And you could, of course, kill yourself on a variety of things. All that is true. Um, but those decisions were largely left up to the American people before 1970. The reason we see a criminalization of drugs um, and personal choice regarding drugs is that in 1970, President Richard Nixon wanted to arrest the leadership of the Black Panther organization, and he knew that they used marijuana. And so marijuana was criminalized so that Nixon could arrest the Black Panthers and did so. Um, number five, there was a rejection of traditional customs like marriage, taxes, and church. Um, there was, in the 1960s, there was still, in Illinois, common law marriage. Common law is law simply agreed upon by custom and usage. And we see the last common law in Illinois abolished in the 1960s. Uh, common law marriage means that if you and someone else are shacking up, if you're living together um, outside the bonds of holy wedlock, if you're not married but you're living together, then uh, you are, according to the, US, to the Illinois government, living in a condition of sin. And they would marry you without your consent. They would mail you a marriage certificate. And people in the countercultural revolution basically ignored it and then sometimes decided they didn't like that other person and they'd go live with someone else. And what is the, what is the state going to do? Unmarry you and then remarry you? Well, there was no mechanism for unmarrying. They just said that you were in a state of adultery at that point. And it was extremely complicated and um, the 1960s saw us get rid of common law marriage. We decided that the government should not be able to forcibly uh, marry you when you were engaged in a, in a relationship, a sexual relationship, a geographic relationship, living with someone else. Um, a lot of things changed in the 60s and 70s. In the next slide, you'll see an image of Woodstock. Uh, Woodstock occupies a mythical place in American history. Everybody thinks they know a lot about Woodstock. The reality is it was kind of dirty. People were hungry. Some people got pregnant. Um, there was no medical services. Uh, most of the people in this image in slide 43 didn't buy a ticket. They ruined that guy's farmland. Um, there, it was sort of a... Uh, it was not what a lot of people thought. Um, the people who showed up, of course, were hippies, but they had the money to simply pick up and go. They had the freedom um, economically to choose what they were going to do, and they were able to be free, so to speak. Um, ultimately, so there's more about the countercultural revolution later. Um, we'll get back to that. But ultimately, President Nixon, with withdrew troops from Vietnam in a process he called Vietnamization. He said that we would have, and I'm quoting, peace with honor. And there's a story 
that comes to us from the post-war, the almost post-war meeting. Near the end of the war, the Americans and the South Vietnamese sat on one side of the table, and the North Vietnamese sat on the other side of the table. And there was a talk about Americans leaving. And General Westmoreland, the guy in charge of the American troops, said, we beat you guys in every fight that counted. When we wanted to win, we won. We held the hills, we held the valleys, we held anything we wanted to because we simply have more power. And the North Vietnamese um, counterpart to Westmoreland, the guy in charge of the NVA, politely waited during this rant and he said, yes sir, uh, that, yes sir, that is correct sir. And at the end of Westmoreland's um, angry uh, diatribe against the North Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese general said, while all that is true, it is also irrelevant. You're leaving. And so there are still people in America who in some way believe we won the Vietnam War. When you take the football and you leave the field in the third quarter, there is no mechanism through which you can say you won the game. When you quit, you have given up. You forfeit. America lost the Vietnam War through forfeit. And that's because when we entered, we had no idea how to get out of there. There was no exit strategy. There was no condition upon which, when met, America could claim victory. And so um, it was simply an extended process of the Truman Doctrine, opposing communism wherever we found it. Because we didn't understand the difference between communism and nationalism, apparently. Um, yeah, you know, on the next slide, it says Nixon hoped to achieve peace with honor. Um, the South Vietnamese government was not able to sustain the war once America left. Um, in the image, this on the right, this is the last helicopter out of Saigon. And I'm pretty sure all those people are not getting on it. So I, have, of course, have this um, meme at the end, this political cartoon that uses the Vietnam Wall as the background. Uh, indicating that a lot of people died in Vietnam, and a lot of people have died in the Iraq War. Uh, and I have the greatest, res having served in the military, I have the greatest respect for those who chose to serve, and even more for those who paid the ultimate price in defense of our nation. Um, I would like to ask, though, what is the exit strategy for Iraq? Did we ever actually learn the lessons of the Vietnam War? Um, so. We only have two assignments this week. We'll never have more than two assignments. I've been putting angry rants on Facebook about teachers giving out too much homework uh, to students in this new environment. And so uh, you'll never get more than two a week from me. And the first one is simply an opinion. Uh, would you please send me an email and tell me whether or not we learned the lessons of the Vietnam War? Because America's longest running war is happening right now. and there's no exit strategy. We've been through how many presidents now? Five, four, five presidents um, in this same war, and none of them, no, no president has any idea how to get out of the Middle East. Just, it's, it's never ending. And so, um, once the Iraq war began and America's participation in it started, um, I'm not sure anyone really thought ahead or asked the questions that we were supposed to have learned from Vietnam. In fact, I'm starting to wonder if anyone really learns history at all. I hope you have a great week. I look forward to, there will be another video on Tuesday, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday at 1 p.m. Central.